everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I just want to, my name is Carolyn Keough. I'm the Director of Education and Public Programs at the Olana Partnership. And I just want to pass things over to Kate, um, who will be joining us for intro remarks. Hope you're having a great evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for Living with Pollinators. My name is Kate McCanary, and I am the curator at the Thomas Cole National Historic Site and co-curator of cross-pollination. And I'm just so excited and have been looking forward to this talk um, with two of the featured artists, Lisa Sanditz and Paula Hayes, who will be in conversation tonight with Chris Lehman of Fox Farm Apiary, and our panel moderators, Amanda Malstrom and Carolyn Keough. The conversation tonight is presented by the Thomas Cole National Historic Site and the Olana Partnership at Olana State Historic Site. And the talk is on the occasion of our collaborative exhibition. If you haven't seen it, please come. Um, it's one simultaneous exhibition at both historic artist sites that we created together in partnership with Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art. It features over 85 works by 25 artists and the exhibition explores pollination in nature and ecology, as well as pollination as a metaphor for the interplay of art and science and relationships among artists across generations. So come and see it, it's up until October 31st. Before we start, and I hand it over to our incredible moderators and panelists, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the land. It is with gratitude that we acknowledge that we are gathering on the ancestral lands of the Mohegan, Mohawk, Lenape, Haudenosaunee, and other Algonquin speaking indigenous peoples. We pay honor and respect to our ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable space for all. We respect the enduring relationships that exist between these people and the land and waterways. Thank you, Amanda, you're up. Um, hi, I'm Amanda Malmstrom. I will be co-moderating this panel with Carolyn tonight. I am the assistant curator at the Thomas Cole National Historic Site. So this is our second virtual panel during the run of cross-pollination, which as Kate said, is an exhibition which explores the interconnection between art and science, between pollinators and their environment, and between artists. So these themes of cross-pollination hold a really unique resonance in 2021. This past year and a half, we've experienced a heavy reminder of how essential connection and relationships are. Thus, as Cross Pollination does, this program brings artists in conversation with each other and with environmentalists. So tonight we welcome two brilliant artists whose work is included in Cross Pollination, Lisa Sanditz and Paula Hayes, who are internationally known artists, but lucky for us, are based here in the Hudson Valley. And they will be in conversation with Chris Lehman to provide his perspective as a beekeeper. I now want to welcome Carolyn, who will introduce the panelists in more detail. Thank you so much, Amanda. I'm just so excited for this conversation and can't wait um, to see what's in store. So with that, I'll introduce our wonderful speakers this evening. Um, Lisa Sanditz's home and studio are in the Hudson Valley, as Amanda pointed out. She teaches at Bard as a visiting artist. She is currently working towards future exhibitions with Hux Huxley Parlor Gallery in London, where she had a solo show last fall, and with Jonathan Ferreira Gallery, New Orleans, Louisiana, where she had a solo show in the fall of 2019. Her work will be included in the upcoming exhibition, Landscape and Memory at Pamela Salisbury Gallery in Hudson, New York, and is included in our wonderful exhibition, which I encourage everyone to see, um, Cross Pollination. Paula Hayes is an American visual artist and designer who works with sculpture, installation art, and landscape design. Hayes lived and worked in New York City for over two decades and now lives in Athens, New York since 2013. Hayes is known for her terrariums and other living artworks, as well as her large-scale public and private landscape commissions. A major theme in Hayes's work is the connection of people to the natural environment, and much of her work is about the evolving relationship to growing and maintaining large and small ecosystems. And lastly, Chris and Lisa Lehman at Fox Farm Apiary maintain several apiaries, with one at their farm in New York's Greene County near the Alcove Reservoir, from which the city of Albany draws its water, and others on properties throughout five counties in the Hudson Valley. In addition, Fox Farm are proud to be beekeepers at Olana, from where Chris and I are broadcasting this evening, Opus 40, Green Land Trust, and Woodstock Land Conservancy. 
Chris Lehman is an independent researcher devoted to deeply understanding and supporting the life of the hive. He received his master's beekeeper certification from Cornell University in June 2021, and he maintains a pollinator garden at Thorn Preserve in Woodstock, New York, and shares his knowledge and expertise by mentoring, consulting, and leading educational pollinator walks, such as the ones that he leads here at Olana. So with that, I think I'm turning it over to Lisa for your presentation. Hello, everybody. Thank you for those warm introductions. Um, thank you so much for including me in this panel and as well as the cross pollination show itself. Um, extra thanks go out to Kate Mancanary for her visionary support through um, the process of the show and the making of the pollinator map. So as always, much gratitude. Um, and of course, to my um, dazzling collaborator, Emily Starter, who worked on the map project hand in hand with me. Um, she may jump in later for, with some uh, comments, but um, I will kind of explain the pollinator map. Um, so in these short 10 minutes, I will go over the pollinator map and guide that was made especially for the cross pollination show, um, discuss the piece that I have, ceramic piece I have in the show, um, and go over my painting practice itself. Um, as well as 100 million years of geologic history. So um, I'm gonna get started. Um, so this is the amazing pollinators map done in collaboration with Emily Sutter and myself. Um, we have been working side by side as artists for about 20 years. She also lives in the Hudson Valley. We went to grad school together and then shared a studio in New York years ago. Um, and this was a really exciting opportunity to work together. Um, the maps and guides, hopefully some of you already have seen them and have them in hand. They're available at the um, Cole and Olana and Basilica sites for free or with admission. Um, it's two-sided. Um, we kind of each took turns kind of laying out one side and the other. Emily put this side together first um, and I was just completely enchanted with this sort of dynamic graphic novel um, kind of riff. Um, and I think we really wanted to do something that was um, useful and, um, but kind of an alternative to something that is maybe more, um, a, you know, a sort of naturalist guide um, that you had seen before. So just kind of trying to draw people into this conversation through a different visual language. Um, so as we kind of went into the research, um, I'll get into a little bit uh, in a bit, um, some of the sources we used to kind of, kind of uh, navigate the research. Um, but it became pretty clear that the things that we needed to focus on for this was the um, poll pollinators themselves, um, and then the habitats that support them, and then the plants that support them. And then how can we talk about anything um, ecological these days without thinking about the idea of um, of the threats to those to those systems, um, and I should say, um, you know, Kate just kind of approached me at some point just to make an artist map that related to the show, and um, it kind of we the conversation um, sort of became like let's focus on pollinators of this area. Um, here's a text excerpt from the guide side. So just to know, I think even going into this myself, um, you know, that pollinators are moving pollen specifically, not um, seeds or berries. It's a little different. And that uh, the hummingbird, um, maybe Chris, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that the hummingbird is the only bird in the Northeast that is considered a pollinator. Um, so these are some of the habitats you can see here. So um, these are places for you, whether you're in the Hudson Valley or wherever you live to maintain and consider um, to promote your local pollinators. Some of these pollinators are local here and many of them are all over the country. Um, and these are some of the plants that support the pollinators. Um, there are more plants and there are more pollinators. This is sort of a condensed list, um, kind of researching some of the more common ones, um, the ones that are more um, prolific. Um, and sort of what fit visually and a, and a range of plants, bushes, trees, um, and these are the threads. And then throughout the map, um, I tried to use the things that were red um, 
as a kind of indicator of something that's um, a threat. Um, some invasive are threats and some actually are quite helpful in um, um, keeping this um, ecosystem going. Their benefit outweighs their um, detriment. Um, okay, and here's a, so um, Emily kind of did more of the sort of graphic text and the pencil drawings, which are the pollinators themselves. And I tended to work on the flora or the flowers, um, anything the sort of growing the habitats and the growing um, plants and flowers, trees, bushes. Um, the names are on the pollinators themselves. And then there's a little key for the plants. Um, I have a field clover here, sunflower, um, um, mallow, rose. Um, RSP was short for red, spotted purple. I couldn't, too, it was too long, couldn't fit it in. Um, like in a lot of my paintings too, I kind of switched up the orientation, um, partially thinking um, that, you know, plants and bugs um, and animals don't have the same kind of vantage point as we do necessarily. So kind of thinking about the different ways that these creatures might view the landscape that they're interacting with. Some catchy text, dynamic, thrilling. Um, <clears throat> and then also wanting to focus on um, the three sites that really supported this too. So calling attention to that, um, which are the Thomas Cole site, Olana site and Basilica. So, and I think you can see here from the map side, um, you know, it's a, loosely a map, but there is um, a sense of orientation in terms of um, New York City to the South, Canada to the North, the Hudson River um, uh, running between the two, um, the one of the original names of the Hudson River, um, the Maha, I'm going to not say it right, but it's in the upper right corner there, upside down, um, which is, uh, is the river that flows both ways, um, and some other, um, you know, the Rip Van Winkle Bridge, Little Points, Catskill, um, some of the thorough, thoroughfares. Um, we use various source material. Um, I should also say this was done during the pandemic, um, which actually gratefully we had sort of another year to stretch this out. Um, there was a lot of sort of meeting at the Elizaville Diner and uh, putting the map in back and forth between each other's cars as we couldn't, um, we actually started maybe for a month working together on the project. And then it just kind of became this um, handing off, which um, I think actually worked really well. Um, it can kind of give us time and space to work autonomously and come together. Um, these are some of the books that were really helpful. Um, a couple other books, just in terms of visuals, um, at least that I worked with, and uh, Emily, I know, worked with the, um, the previous uh, book also. Um, visuals and research, um, and also um, definitely great research. Um, in email conversation, actually, we didn't really, I don't know if we ever had a conversation. Um, Eric Kiviet, um, Evan Abramson, and um, Glenda Berman, they, ga they gave great information um, and other, there were other sources too um, to work from. Hmm. Why is my image slide not going? Okay, there we go. This is perfect. I'm having, if anyone can see, I have a fly that's paying a lot of attention to me. So, you know, bugs, they're present. They know, they know what's going on. Um, and here's just a little bit of the work in, prog in progress, um, you know, a healthy diet of local um, chocolate milk, um, uh, some wine, lots of um, cut up paper scraps, colored pencils, and then you can see on the right, um, so Emily gave me um, the drawings of the pollinators and cutting them up and putting them together. Um, and I'm really, really happy with the printing. It's beautiful. And I think it still, it maintains this sort of handmade feel to it, even though it was sort of photographed and then um, cleaned up in Photoshop. Okay, so that brings me to sort of part two. Um, um, this is um, an image of a uh, shopping cart of zebra mussels, covered in zebra mussels that was um, removed from a lake in Minnesota. Um, 
you can look further about um, zebra mussels, but they are very, very aggressive invasive species, um, clogging um, waterways in 23 states, including in New York State. Um, they filter a lot of nutrients out of the water and make it impossible for other um, organisms to live. Um, this is uh, the piece of the cross-pollination show called laptop zebra mussel, all one word. Um, so kind of smushing the words together in the way that um, the zebra mussels themselves um, attach onto objects. Um, I had ambitions of doing working on a shopping cart, but um, on hand I had a laptop and um, I think we're all kind of wondering ways how to use our um, discarded technology, right? So um, I thought this was a great way to kind of combine um, this aggressive um, invasive uh, of zebra mussels that were brought over on cargo ships um, with us, because we are really um, one of the best invasive species. Humans are doing a really good job of topping the charts for that one. Um, and I made the sort of rock formation and the leg is from a broken like statuette that we had at our house too. So all of the zebra mussels I made here are hand are mostly uh, are handmade with clay. Um, there's some like seashells and sand in, in the piece too. Um, and you know we start talking about pollinators, um, but I think you know talking about invasives kind of goes hand in hand. Um, the Anthropocene is a catchphrase I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, but um, kind of thinking about this era um, that is defined geologically by the um, human impact. This is what's called a plastiglomerate, which is one of the newest um, geological um, terms. It's of a rock that's uh, made of plastic and sand that through heat and um, movement in the ocean and campfires, especially like in Hawaii, have formed to a hard enough substance that it's considered a rock formation. So I kind of thought, you know, came across the, the um, shopping cart image and this, and then kind of that led to making the sculpture. This is a 150 million year old Jurassic fossil, more or less. This is a 15 year old Anthropocene fossil. These are a few other forms that I've made. Um, thinking about kind of the aging process of consumer products and the things we use, um, how they calcify and how um, plant and animal life kind of um, attach themselves to it. This is in combination in a show in New Orleans two years ago in combination with a painting of mine and actually kind of, um, you know, somewhat ironically, I suppose at the heart of my practice is really painting. Um, and I do a lot of painting here in the Hudson Valley, plein air painting this. I did this summer at Lake Minnewaska. Um, and then also do a lot of more of painting um, back in my studio, really thinking about a lot of these issues of the relationship between the built environment, human impact, um, and also just the joy of pleasure of moving through these spaces, um, the kind of amazing things that we can create in them, the, the animals and plant life that's willing to share the space with us. Here's a number of those um, studies, um, small kind of studies I done. I did plain air um, together. This is in New Orleans. Um, and then during the pandemic, I did a sort of series of paintings um, called upside down walks, um, that sort of disorientation of that time period, especially um, in the spring of 2020. Um, and this is a painting of um, Kate, who's on the screen here with us, that I did after a hike with her. Um, I forgot where, she'll probably remember where. They're about 16 by 20. So the landscapes are oriented, um, following the rules of gravity, but the humans are disoriented. This is a larger piece from a few years ago of the um, compost at Miglarelli Farm. Um, and I'm gonna end it there. Ghost fox painting I did um, last summer after seeing a dead fox on the side of the road near here. Um, 
all oil on campus. All right, so thank you so much. I'm going to end it here. I was supposed to get a warning. Oh, maybe I did get a warning and I missed it. Oh, all right, sorry. I just went over a minute. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Thank you so much, everybody. Talk to you later. Um, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. Um, uh, I am so excited uh, to be part of cross pollination. It's, it's um, couldn't be more of a perfect um, place to land. Um, personally and my work, um, everything I've been working on um, for so many years um, and to how I came to the Hudson Valley, um, Thomas Cole House was really one of the places that I really felt, I really wanna live here. And then to be in an exhibition at both Alana and Thomas Cole, um, has, um, has been really um, um, uh, a dream come true. So this image, I mean, <laughs> it was great to have um, a conversation. Um, I'm so bad with technology that I uh, had to have a personal dress rehearsal. <laughs> and, um, when we were discussing what images um, I was seeing uh, to Amanda, uh, well, the pieces that are in the exhibition. And um, so it was really great because the whole, since I live uh, four miles from Thomas Cole House, um, I've had this very intimate engagement with every aspect of um, the exhibition. And that's what I'm really about is, um, intimacy and attentiveness with, um, with what I do. So it's perfect. Um, and you can see this is very, it's uh, very, very early spring and I'm installing the bird nesting tree. And um, we, I said, uh, you know, let's, let's, ins you know, let's put it together uh, um, at this uh, particular time. I think this is March, April and um, they will come. And we, we're not gonna be able to control which bird um, comes, um, but uh, one will come. And then um, rope off an area that nothing gets mowed. And um, uh, so that's, this is the day. Um, you see, it's like the, <laughs> the pandemic and, um, but uh, we had faith, so. Um, came and um, I put the bird nesting tree, uh, bird nest um, onto the tree. And um, um, let, we let the grasses and everything else grow. Um, and uh, sure enough, um, some time goes by. And if we go to the next one, Heather. Um, some time goes by, you can see it's summer. And I would visit the site and uh, everyone there um, was so excited to see oh, a wren. <laughs> um, a wren family um, came. So, you know, I worked with an ornithologist and, you know, a lot of people um, really brought the, brought the bluebirds back um, by bluebird nesting. Um, houses. And um, so this was designed um, very, very specifically um, for bluebirds, but they've attracted all kinds of um, uh, birds. Um, and in this particular setting, um, a wren, who's a, a very, um, they like to nest in uh, human-made uh, cavities. It could be all kinds of things. It could be a bucket, it could be a wheelbarrow, outside, you know, something left around. And in this case, it was um, the sculpture. Um, they're very aggressive. Um, uh, don't go too near. So it's um, the she she made the nest, and then the babies fledged, and um, it was great. Um, I loved it. Um, you know, it brings. I, I'm happy every time. Um, there's been all kinds of birds in different settings with different bird nesting trees that have been in different gardens, um, pollinator gardens that I've made um, around. And uh, 
it just, you know, the first time I saw it, I, I cried really because I was, I was just so happy that it worked and um, it works. Um, you make it, they come. <laughs> um, and I was saying to Amanda, like, it's a wait for it. <laughs> and that's kind of my work, um, wait for it. And um, my, my relationship with ecology, it's a spiritual one, spiritual ecology. And like I said, it's an intimate um, relationship with the natural world and attentiveness and an intimate um, connection. Um, that is something that I hope, um, I have faith that you, um, you, you, you put it out there in the world and it will connect. So, um, and it, it, it's in all of the work that I do, I, I hope. Um, so you can show the next one, next uh, picture. And, um, you know, I, I kind of tend to, especially when I was younger and um, there was a moment, uh, you know, I was making a lot of work that was so ephemeral that it would just it literally blow away. But you open the door of a room like in graduate school, um, especially I was making these things with strings and papers and um, they were just constantly getting wrecked. And uh, it was kind of this, I, I realized I was making, I was trying to make a garden. It was Ikebana, it was a garden, it was something, you know, so I finally, I was, cause I, I've always, I've been a horticulturist, I've been making gardens, I was taking care of gardens um, and, but then I was like, what is it that can, you know, have a body? And then it was like glass. So I, um, and I was really fascinated with the beginnings of the industrial revolution. It seemed like we really took a weird turn there as a species. I mean, it starts age of enlightenment. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, you know, kind of going toward this, you know, reason, um, coming, you know, it's reason is making a, you know, it's like, I was like some sort of race and it's getting ahead of um, faith and a kind of connection to something um, beyond the material world. Um, and right around, you know, mid 19th century, um, and I, you know, that Crystal Palace and the Wardian case, it really, I was really, really looking at it and the glass of the Wardian case. And I, so I was working with um, glass blowers and I, this form of the opening being on the side and this world within. And this image, I just love because, you know, I think of Alana and you walk up the stairs and you look at that view, you know, which was so incredible. Um, everything is kind of about that. And um, this majestic valley um, of the river carving this space and this bubble of glass with these gems um, collected taken out of the earth. Um, there is a, you know, there is a, there's a argument in there. <laughs> um, we're taking, um, but where's the responsibility? Um, so, you know, selfishness, greed, apathy are kind of more the thing to work on um, in regard to setting the course straight. And so I am really looking at these things when I make, um, these things in glass more than as a decorative object. So the next um, image, please, Alec. Thank you. So the living ones, the the one on the left um, is 17 years old, and the one on the right is a three couple of years old. Um, but the one on the left, um, 17 years, is, is, is close to the period of time that I've been making them, and it really is very close to my heart. I. Um, it's moved with me, it's been with me, it's, I'm so connected to it. Um, and to have it so close to Thomas Cole, you know, because he had, a, he had a feeling, you know, he had a warning. Um, 
and he was melancholic. <laughs> um, you know, the, the feelings of what we're doing to our world have been, you know, around a long time. It's not, you know, the last 20 years or something. It's, it's been, it's deep. And there's been people very, very, you know, and it's a spiritual melody. So, you know, for me, that that's there is so sacred and so beautiful. I'm very moved by it. And I'm very grateful um, to the curators here and them choosing me to be part of this exhibition. I am really very grateful. Um, and uh, it means it means the world to me, really. And I mean that the world. <laughs> um, so they're little worlds and they're about the combination of desire and responsibility together um, and caring for them. Um, it's about caring, um, which is you know kind of a big deal. Um, so, and uh, the next image. Heather, thank you. So that's um, um, one of the things I love about this little film, which my, um, my gallerist, um, Christina Grajales, um, she, did, she took this little film and uh, we had a really wonderful time. Um, <laughs> um, I'm talking to Christina and uh, she took this film. The thing I really love about this is my ability to balance all these bags. Um, I'm really so, um, I, I take care of things all the time, you know? I'm a grandmother, I, uh, I'm of course a mother then too, um, uh, but um, I'm always, you know, attending to my work. It's alive um, in so many ways. And uh, look, I'm just carrying these bags and like watering this, you know, with a turkey baster. I, <laughs> it's one of the things I really love about this little film. You can see, I just came from the pool um, at the, the um, uh, community pool in Athens, which is so wonderful. It's been there since the 60s. It's just a great place of community. Um, but uh, it, it's, you know, going, being able to go there and do it myself because I, I was, lived down the road was just one of the great things about being part of cross pollination. Um, to be able to have the living terrariums there, it's kind of like, um, you know, a chance of a lifetime. Um, very grateful for that. Um, and I, I, is there another slide? I can't really remember. I'm, I'm, I think that's our last image. I believe so. So on that, you know, I would say, um, you know, really with mine, um, how the industrial revolution, you know, everything went to means to an end, it's utilitarian. Um, mine is more trying to really get at, um, they're not objects, um, they're, they're, um, they're about caring and taking care of something. And um, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a struggle, but like, um, been doing it a long time and it's really fantastic. Um, sometimes with uh, landscapes that I've designed, you know, now it's getting on like 10, 15 or more years and I'm still involved. You know, I've seen families grow up. Um, I go back and uh, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm uh, attending to a, a landscape again, you know, after what is, it's like 17 years, all the growth and being involved with the people. Um, that intimacy, that connection. And I think that is also a very ecological um, uh, action. And uh, so with that, I uh, pass it over to the, the, the next speaker. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Hello, everybody. My name is Chris Lehman and welcome tonight. I'm really pleased to be uh, joining you. This is fine people. I loved hearing your, uh, seeing your presentations. My name is Chris and I've been a beekeeper now for 13 years. And uh, our goal has been to uh, make sure that our landscapes are healthy and sustainable for bees and all pollinators, which helps support us. So I'd like to start with our first picture of, next slide, please. Okay, this is one of those early flowers that uh, 
has been largely misunderstood and grows here in abundance at Olana. And I'm very grateful for that. Uh, when springtime comes here, there's not a lot of sources of pollen. And this is uh, the most important source to come into the hive at this time, because this is what is needed to be able to uh, raise uh, young, young bees. This, this particular dandelion here has eight out of the 10 amino acids. So it's not really high in pollen and amino acids needed. However, it does contain zinc. So it's one of those very important plants that many counties south of us have spent millions of dollars to try to destroy. And it's a wonderful plant for humans. It, uh, all pollinators love it. And with the zinc, it's the most important thing because with threats that we have from extra carbon in our atmosphere, uh, makes plants grow faster. However, they, they can't extract all the needed nutrients to the flower. So a lot of the pollen that's coming out, if there's not enough zinc in there, is almost useless. So we have to try to, as we redesign our landscape, which is never gonna be the same now, uh, some of these species, which is a non-native species, is essential in the survival of honeybees and pollinators very early in the season. It gives them a really good head start. Next slide, please. This is at Olana. This is a pollen being collected by a, a female worker, a foraging bee. This is dogwood pollen. And uh, at Olana, it's, it's, it's a wonderful place because there's many sources of pollen from many different locations. We have uh, the benefits of having a riparian zone nearby. So we have uh, midsummer plants all down by the river that provide um, more than enough nutrition. We have beautiful trees that um, the legacy of Frederick Church has left us. Some of the seeds from those trees have still remained here. And uh, they are the great sources of propolis, which is the tree resin most needed for bees to keep a good healthy hive. And of course, the, the biodiversity, the pollen that is needed. Uh, we need as many sources as we can throughout the year. And really quick with the rain that we've had this year, we've actually had some challenges with pollen. If we have a period of rain for more than a week, the queen may stop laying and uh, it may be sunny the next day, but that doesn't mean that the pollen has been largely washed away at that moment and the nectar from the flowers. So our ecology is very fragile at the moment. And uh, we do have an encroaching forest which provides nutrition until it's done in around June and July. And then we're most uh, reliant on what grows on the ground. But it's very important that the pollen comes in steadily when uh, we had a couple periods this this uh, summer where the only pollen that was coming in was from chicory and jewelweed and this went on for almost a month straight with only two sources but thank you know we were thankful to have them but these are your dish flowers that we really would don't want uh, glyphosate sprayed on because these are also the pathways for many of the uh, pollinators because they can't fly very far so this is how they travel and expand next slide please this is another beautiful summer bee this is the Megachylae lugopoda, and it's on Echinacea. Echinacea is one of the plants that I do include in all my pollinator gardens because with the, a lot of the challenges that uh, bees face with nutritional de deficiencies and also disease, this is a very healthy source for them to have for a decent uh, bloom time in August. And uh, these are a beautiful, this is a, you can see the yellow on the bottom of this bee, it collects pollen a little differently. This is called their scopa, so they, collect all their pollen beneath their abdomen and bring it back to their hives. And they are different than the other bees. These are, these are the solitary bees. And um, in fact, right now, many of them are mating and uh, laying eggs that will be through the winter and then they will emerge in the spring. Next slide, this is a beautiful bumblebee on one of my favorite plants at the Thorn Preserve. And the Thorn Preserve is a 60 acre piece of land that uh, was once used for haying and uh, for some agriculture, but is now a pollinator preserve. And it only took a few years for a, a variety of pollinators to have several uh, generations already on this property, uh, lots of milkweed as well. But this is mountain mint, and this is one of the most important plants for the pollinators. It provides, uh, provides nectar and pollen through, uh, throughout the summer for at least 13 weeks. Next, next slide, please. Oop. 
Okay, good. This is borage. This is a very important plant. It is another non-native species. It is native to the Middle East, I believe Syria. And it's very nutritious. It's nutritious for humans. Uh, bumblebees certainly love it. Honeybees gather a decent honey crop from it. But what the benefit of having this plant, especially at Olana, would be one of the missing links because other than pollen, and we, they also need from that pollen, they need proper sterols, fats and lipids and things like that. And borage is one of the richest sources of 24-methylene cholesterol for healthy membranes and is uh, very uh, important in their diet. And it does bloom all summer long. So it is a non-native species, non-invasive, but very nutritious for the bees. Next slide, please. This is one of our favorites, another uh, beautiful midsummer bloom. This is Menarda fistulosa. This is native to the area. So whenever you get a chance to plant some Menarda fistulosa, they will spread. Um, they are real cloud pleasers. You'll see plenty of butterflies and all the, um, all the bees, native and non-native, gathering nectar from this plant. It's a, it's a sure winner. And the, the mountain mint, of course, wherever you can plant mountain mint, it will spread. It's uh, native to uh, the area more in the mountainous regions, but uh, all of the butterflies I see on here, I see all the, the solitary wasps, all the native bees, they absolutely love this plant. This is another medicinal plant for them, very important to have. And I strongly encourage any, anybody that is starting your pollinator garden to get the best results that this would be a, a, a perfect uh, addition to your pollinator garden. Next slide. Okay, this is one of my uh, favorite riparian zone plants. This is button bush. And this is a beautiful midsummer bloom that uh, is native. And it's also a host plant to a couple of very important uh, big showy moths, the hydrangea sphinx and the titan sphinx. And uh, when we think about our host plants, these are the plants that uh, our pollinators will actually nest in and um, lay eggs that uh, if we're concerned about another important pollinator in our area, which are the bats, um, it's largely a nutritional deficiency that they've been going through to cause these problems. So it's very important that they do get what they need from the moth center in the area. They need that protein. And also it's a very important plant for the bees and all bumblebees and all the others. It's a beautiful one. Okay, this is an example of a an applied ecological disturbance. This is something that we can do on a slightly larger scale. This is at my house at a pond that I had dug um, just 25 years ago with the intention of bringing more bird habitat to the area and also fish. And uh, unknowingly at the time, it, it ended up bringing a, a beautiful variety of uh, pollinators to the area. And this is, this is something also Frederick Church had done. He performed this on an even larger scale with that pond being hand dug. That is an applied ecological disturbance. So it might look a little unnatural at first, but it's, it's providing it's habitat creation and it's works and it's working. So next slide, please. And the, sometimes the aquatic plants get overlooked. A lot of the times they're a, they're a hazard in ponds. But if you take a second look through a nutritional lens, you can see that water shield that grows it. It only provides nectar from about 9.30 to 10.30 in the morning, but the bees come out in droves for this pollen, and it's a really important one to have. Okay, the natural way that bees uh, reproduce is by swarming, and uh, this is in Leeds, New York, and this was a swarm that ended up on a, on a Greek re revival and then never left, so we found this hive in October. So probably one of the most beautiful specimens of a swarm that we've seen form this way where their comb is perfectly round and there was a huge population. I was able to get up there on a lift and uh, transfer this to a, a beehive and they did make it through the winter. It is challenging this time. Most swarms usually occur naturally in May and June and that's usually the ideal time to get them. Next slide, please. And occasionally this was uh, at a restaurant, the Stewart House in Athens and during dinner hour, uh, it's, it's nice to have someone you can call to come get a swarm. It's actually a, a quite a phenomenon to witness. It's not something to ever panic. It's for you to witness if it happens near you and just enjoy it and take it in because this is nature at its best is watching a swarm. Now, they won't sting you because most of them carry enough nectar in their bodies to prepare for this and need to bend their abdomens in order to sting. But it's the last thing on their mind during a swarm. And I will finish by some of the other beautiful uh, plants that are available here at Olana because it's such a variety of habitats. This is skunk cabbage. 
And this is the very first source of pollen for the honeybees. And I found this in uh, mid-March. They usually, uh, depending on our winters, can be, emerge sooner. And they last at least two or three weeks. And this is a very important pollen source. This is the very first, and I saw that they brought it in. So it's very important that their population right off the get-go is as large as it can be with this, the most pollen coming in. And I will end it there. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all so much. So I would invite um, some of our speakers to come on. And I also would just give a plug uh, to our audience members today. If you have any questions, if there's anything that you're wondering or you'd like to respond um, to any of the presenters, please feel free to type in the chat or use the Q&A function to submit your question. We're hoping to field some audience responses now. So we have about 10 minutes left and um, we're eager to start the conversation. Yeah, thank you, Chris, Lisa, and Paula. Um, I love how you brought us to outside of our museums. Like we talk a lot about, um, you know, our sites, but to talk about the natural environment and Paula for you to install a bird nesting house outside and Chris to maintain the, the beehives at Olana. Um, that's really important to both the Olana and Coal Site mission. Uh, the Coal Site recently joined the pollinator pathway this year and Olana has amazing robust programming outside yeah we're like so fortunate to work um with chris to lead some pollinator walks and it was just so fascinating hearing your list of um plants as i was going through the pollinator map kind of trying to see if any were listed there i just think that there's such a fascinating intersection between all of your works so i would invite you know i would invite um paula lisa and chris if there's anything that you want to chime in or any responses that you have to each other's presentations before we dive into some audience questions I would like to just mention one, one thing quick that led me to this place to be involved in bees. And uh, for many, many years, I had uh, been a member of the Native American Institute in Albany, the board member. And so I got an introduction to the land through Native Ives uh, around 2000, or at least for a year or so. To start there and then the ultimate compliment when we're reshaping the land is to bring a lot of the plants back from this period, shed, trees. American chestnut beach, a lot of these trees that were dependent on by Native Americans, especially in the River Valley. Uh, it was mostly burned one to three miles on the inside of each coast. And it's really amazing to see that what we can do now to honor them by planting the plants for the native pollinators in their own. Hi, Lisa. I will say they were having storms in the Hudson Valley right now. Yeah, I'm um, sorry, I keep losing service. Great, well, I guess I'll kick it off with a question, but in all of the work you presented, there is a really keen awareness um, for how humans have affected um, this region. And I wonder if you could speak um, to how we grapple with this notion of humans affecting um, the natural world, both from an artistic practice um, and environmental practice. Who would well, like to start us off? Yeah, um, yeah. If you don't mind, I, I see that there's two there's two sections of you know, when we mention people and what people do to the environment. We have these very large corporations that are separate from us and have done the most damage, and then there's the rest of our population that have been waking up over the years, and we're more awake than ever on what works and what doesn't work. We've actually paid attention, just like I did as a kid when I first saw heard about PCBs in the Hudson River and didn't think that we could do anything about that, but we had smart people make better decisions and now we have eagles that we can see every day so i know that there's a lot that humans can do and often we hear the negative side of it which usually comes from you know these large horrible corporations in fact we really dodged a bullet 20 years ago by preventing ourselves from setting up here in hudson we almost had a cement here and i'm so glad that you know there was enough people that understood the damage and already had other incidents like this. So we're catching on and there, there's certain things that we're not gonna allow anymore, especially where we live. And that, that's the most encouraging thing is we have a lot of people woken up now. We have a lot of children now that aren't gonna take it. Uh, we have a lot of children now that are, that are pointing their finger at the guy mowing the, the ditches and they're saying, please don't mow my ditch because those flowers are feeding bees. 
I love seeing that. It's very encouraging. Yeah, and I'll just tie that in. I know Gary um, asked a question, what plans are there in place for both Olana and the coal site to increase the presence of pollinator plants for the long term? Um, so I'll just chime in. I know Chris has been such a wonderful advocate um, at Olana about kind of advocating for the bees, advocating for the pollinator plants and the mowing habits and just thinking about kind of when we're mowing, what we're mowing when. Um, that's been an integral part of some of Chris's work at Olana. But, you know, Paula and Lisa, I wonder, um, as artists, kind of, how do you take up this mantle and how do you, um, you know, I, I love the story of the idea of children saying, don't mow. So what's your artist version of that, I guess I would say. Uh, I, I can really piggyback on what Chris was saying. And uh, also, I just want to really thank Chris for, I mean, that plant list was just so great. And um, um kind of really appetizing. <laughs> um, um, but I, I want to piggyback on that uh, about uh, positivity. There, there is a lot of really great, um, there, there, there's, there's, good, there's good things affecting the environment right now. I mean, uh, also that artists are participating in ecological, there's ecological artists that are not only in symbols, but in action. And I think that's a really kind of amazing thing. And, and a, a earth artist from the seventies is really different than an artist right now in terms of ecology. Um, and that has to do with um, how the, there's, there's an active part or an, there is, like I was trying to describe before, an intimate part, a doing part it's not so symbolic, only symbolic. And I think that's an important thing. And plus, um, um, I guess I have to, you know, bring it up later, but, you know, there's a lot of things for, for children in regard to, let's say, like they go to camp and they learn about, you know, or in school, they learn about um, all of these things and activities. And I see it just in um, all of the children that I know. Um, uh, they teach me about um, things and they care. So uh, that's a, yeah, there's a lot of things going on that, that are different than even I would say five, seven to 10 years ago in regard to awareness in um, uh, everyone. And because there's, you know, it's affecting all of our lives in so many ways. Um, yeah, thanks. Those are both really beautiful answers. Um, um, is there an echo? Sorry, I can't do anything about it. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, there's the idea of implementation. So as we're sitting here with the ecologist and someone in a science background, implementation is such a huge part of how to navigate um, ecological sustainability. Um, and so I recognize that, right, as an artist. But I also think that um, art is brings in different entry points. Um, so it's about engaging people, like what's the hook? There's lots of different ways to get involved in that in my altruistic um, idea about art making, it can lead to activism or it can lead to small changes or conversations that um, unfold over you know different time spans. It might take a few years, it might take a few minutes. So um, it's been really great to work hand in hand with ecologists and these institutions all dedicated to that. We have a little bit of a follow-up question from Julia Bryan. Um, I just think, you know, while we're talking a little bit about ecolo ecological artists, Paula, do you have a, names of ecological artists that you could share with us? Or Lisa, do you have any other examples? And Chris, I'd invite you to chime in too if you have any, any thoughts. You mean contemporary? Well, I mean, uh, there's uh, uh, Mark Dion, um, um, also, uh, but I was going to, there's a, there's a question at the end here. <laughs> um, so I can bring it up then about people working actively in the Hudson Valley, um, um, I was saving that for the end, but um, there, there are some, um, there, there are many people that I just, and I tend to be grouped with, Portia Munson, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about her, her work um, a little bit later. Um, people that are in, in this exhibition, um, 
So yeah, I, I'll talk about that a little bit later, um, very specifically. Yeah, we had um, a question that we uh, introduced to our panelists, which was um, what artists, thinkers, writers, scholars, activists, resources, organizations, anything, um, would you recommend our listeners um, to listen to if they're interested in protecting pollinators species in our local habitats? And another question we received from Betsy Jacks was, what are five action steps that people can do to help pollinators? Um, so I guess we could move on to that, Paul, if you wanted to, to talk to anything that inspires you, what action steps you recommend people take, um, people or thinkers that you turn to. Well, um, I guess those are two different questions in a way. Um, it, the, the people in the Hudson Valley um, that I kind of are really um, the, the things that, it, you know, when I was posed that question, um, I do think of uh, Portia Munson and her husband's um, or partner, um, Jared Handelsman. Um, the way they live um, in the Hudson Valley is uh, really incredible. And they, they live in their art and they sculpt the land. It, it's almost like a living museum and um, their way of living um, and Portia's in the show. Um, she's in cross pollination. All these amazing mandala, like banners, and she makes flower mandalas, and she uses plastics in a way that it's like almost like extracting them from going out to sea and never going away. Um, she, uh, the way the way that they live. When I when I went to their um, Sort of say like home as like homestead, um, and this huge blueberry spiral, um, massive, um, as opposed to like you know spiral jetty. It, it's a living spiral. You eat it; it's delicious, nutritious, amazing. Um, and um, so th that's a living artwork and humans that are just in, incredible people that I'm very inspired by. And also uh, Camp Oh My, oh my the fields at Oh My, that place is really very inspiring to me. Um, the way they teach children about um, uh, ecology and the intimacy, um, the way children interact with um, the, the, the land there is really remarkable and um, lasting, lasting impressions on children um, with an intimate connection to the earth. And these were, these were th that was something that really led me. It was one of the, how I came to the Hudson Valley, I had a, um, um, a living artwork in the, in the field um, at Art Oh My, but it, it also the, the camp Oh My for children, I think is just a remarkable, lasting um, Hudson Valley action um, that is generational. So um, those are two, those were the two things that came to my mind regarding that question in the Hudson Valley specifically. Um, I would say um, support your local farms and your local farmers, um, especially ones that do no or low spray. Um, clean your boats. Zebra mussels travel in boats. Clean your boats if you're, boater, if you're boaters, which I know a lot of people are using the Hudson River. Um, and um, maybe someone can jump in. I think the new organization is called Forge that's supporting First Nation artists. Is that right? Um, in the Hudson Valley, and it's a show space, exhibition space residency resource maybe you all can put that in the link i don't want to move my body or i'm afraid i'll lose the internet so um someone else might be able to do that um and then i was just going to add an artist you know of course cross-pollination show but um an artist who i'm continually inspired by is a young artist named khalil robert irving who deals a lot with post-consumer waste so not directly per se with pollinators but you know the more trash we make the less pollinators we will have um, as well as addressing a lot of like systemic racism and classism. Um, and he's just a really amazing artist. So that's what I have to add. Thank you again. Uh, 
So I would just like to say one thing about the mowing practices that have been going on and how slowly people are starting to come around to maybe reducing their lawns by maybe 10 or 20%. Um, the result of this is all good because it's less, less time that you have to go out there. It's less fuels that you'll be using. It's less noise pollution and more pollinators. And I still uh, have to say that I, I, when I'm driving down the roads, I, see, I still see the passion for mowing. I, I see passion for it out there still. And, uh, but we are slowly reaching people. And, and in fact, here at Olana, I've been really grateful to see that to, right to this point that all the goldenrod and asters and everything that's growing out in the fields is, is it remains for now. Uh, the bee can fly pretty far for food, but we don't want them to have to fly so far if they don't need to. This will, this will increase their life. So just, just managing our lands in that way um, ideally, like what we do at the Thorn Preserve, we only mow in November. We wait till late November uh, because during this time, when a lot of people is convenient for people to mow, there's a lot of these uh, social and uh, solitary insects that are out there collecting provisions right now so that they can eat and hibernate for the winter. And they get caught up in this. They get caught up in the brush hogging and things like that. So I would just ask the it's a little less time. You have more time to yourself. It's the most liberating thing I ever did was I used to mow my whole property one time and I couldn't imagine ever going back there again. Uh, and now with, uh, with the mowing practices, it's been about six years now. It's just buzzing. I'm seeing birds I've never seen. I, uh, every day I discover another insect that I didn't exist in. It's just been a magical experience. I encourage, I encourage us to look at our roadsides a little different. Of course, these are the pathways, these are the existing pathways. And someday, and I'd like to see this in our lifetime, time, that we no longer need power lines for our power. And the space, but however, the spaces that are put aside for them and need to remain as, as un, you know, they're not very pretty in our landscape, but they're alive. They are alive. And, and with the forest growing completely over very little food for the pollinators, and the sun's not reaching the plants. So it's, it's not very easy to find that ecological balance, but uh, we start practicing a little bit and we see what works. We do need to have some, let some light into these areas or else the biodiversity is no longer. In fact, uh, the, the red banded polypore that I brought up is a, is a stem uh, decay fungus that is used in a um, little forest, but they create canny, canopy gaps by taking some of the trees down in the forest while at the same time opening it up for deer, for bear, and for all the other animals living. It provides food for them. It's a wonderful thing. Thank you. Thank I just you. want to be mindful. We do have some other questions that have come in, but I just want to be mindful of time. We're at uh, 640. So if anybody needs to hop off, we will be recording this um, so you can view it later. Um, but it's just so interesting, Chris, hearing you talk a little bit about kind of the aesthetic um, view of the landscape and how these decisions might fuel not only our ecological preservation and ecological benefits, but these aesthetic benefits, it just is very churchian to me. So it sounds very much in line with um, some of the ways that church worked and, and navigated Olana. So thanks for that. And I love Chris talking about your mowing practices because that was such, um, that was an important requirement that you Paula gave us when we installed your bird nesting house and tree. Like you have to rope off a parcel of land and keep the grass growing, um, which we began at the cool site is to, to stop mowing large parcels of our land, which I know Alana, you do too, um, because it is important for the, the pollinators. And, you know, we have the Wren family move in um, because you created this perfect environment where pollinators and birds can coexist and interact. Yeah, that's great. We have one other question that came through um, thinking about mowing and some of, you know, how interconnected the foliage is with the pollinators and the life of some of the species we've talked about today. Um, a question came through for you, Chris, about borage as an example of a non-native species, which can offer vitamins and minerals to our local pollinators. There's a question about if if the term non-native is a little bit more misleading than we think. And this is something that you and I talk about pretty often. Um, 
So I don't know if, if any of you have some thoughts about this non-native native species. It's, it's actually been very easy to figure out once you start looking through the bees' eyes and their needs. Because there's there's plants out there that I hear people, they just absolutely hate this plant. You know, there's Japanese not weed and there's purple and stripe and these. And and some of them may be justified to, to get to fit that label. We do need to make really good boundaries with any plants that are in our area. However, these are gifts. They're here for a reason. And um, some of these plants have been nutrition for the bees when nothing else is coming in. So I, I really, appreciate when I think non-native now, I, I really almost ignore it. I'm interested, but first and foremost is nutritional because we have to remember the honeybees are not from here. And during the first few decades of um, honeybees being brought here almost 400 years ago, 1622, that the landscape has greatly changed since then. And so right away, spotted knapweed and all these other plants were brought for sheep fodder that still provide nutrition to the bees today. They're considered invasive. They're still here. They're the like old, old world planting that, uh, you can get a really nice honey crop from. We, we got to, when we had the kids out here for camp, there was still quite a bit of spot, spotted knapweed, knapweed available for them, which was encouraging to see. It was a very nice balance out here uh, with mowing once a year and seeing there's some plants are gonna be a little bit more dominant than others. And then you restart the process. Like in the Thorn Preserve, we've had, you know, Canadian, Canada thistle, which is non-native at the same time that milkweed is native. So they compete with each other. And it seems like the milkweed is a little bit more ground every year. And now we have monarchs just flying around and it's been really encouraging to see the, the success in the short term by just changing those practices. It, it didn't require as much work. It just had to uh, allow certain plants to grow, make nice paths so everyone can walk through and enjoy. But 90% now is, is just pollinator habitat in that area. You make a turnaround very quick. So it's, it's very encouraging. You, you, you yourselves, when, whenever you plant a flower, there's no greater reward than visiting that flower. It might be later that summer, and then you might see a beautiful bee on it. And that's a very uplifting, motivating event for anyone that's just starting out is seeing that the, the success. It, it does quite require work, and we're never going to be able to let the landscape alone. We're, we're going to need to manage it in a certain way where the food is available all year round and and we can't take a month off this summer was very challenging we got a really good look at when there's that much rain coming in that there might only be one or two species of pollen if any coming in during that time it could, it could really be detrimental to the, the, the health of the colony going into winter right now they need to get as much pollen as they can because they've missed out they need to get the fatty bodies they need to get the cholesterol they need to get all that fat so the, the summer bee only might live uh, four weeks, four to five weeks. These bees that are going to be starting to born, be born in October are going to be living all the way to spring. They're going to be the winter bees that will be staying with the hive. This is the only species of its type as a superorganism that will stay together as a colony as one superorganism. And it's just amazing. Well, thank you all so much. I mean, I definitely, I think that there's been, I feel inspired as I always do when I talk um, to Chris, but hearing from you, Lisa and Paula about your work and kind of how um, you can provide a lens through which we can think about these, these ideas and be motivated into action. I mean, I would knew this conversation would be a pleasure. So thank you so much. And definitely, um, if you haven't seen cross-pollination, um, it is up until October 31st at both the coal sites and the Olana um partnership and uh lisa and emily Sarr's pollinator map is available at both of our sites and i know there was a lot of questions about um the list of pollinators so definitely check out lisa and emily's work for that um but i will kick it over to kate to say a final thank you oh well you guys this was so beautiful and i'm inspired and i want to run out to my garden even though the rain is pouring down right now but um thank you so much um, for your work and um, giving us so much to think about and 
works. It's really beautiful and I'm moved. And thank you to everyone who joined us tonight for this conversation. And like um, Carolyn and Amanda said, please come and see the exhibition and all of the works at Alana and the Thomas School site. Have a great evening. Thank you. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.